my garden and I begin to see, let me see, okay. I begin to see bees I had never seen before because up until that point, I really didn't know much about bees. But there were big bees and little bees and striped bees and metallic bees and bees all over that I had never seen before. Like this oblique longhorn bee that has long antennae and really jazzy eyes and it specializes on sunflowers. Uh, and I begin to see flies I didn't know were out there. So just like the bees, there were big flies and little flies and metallic flies and striped <laughs> flies and all kinds of fascinating flies and some that were even beneficial, like this two-inch robber fly that catches its prey in midair. And some things were so beautiful and so interesting that my photographer husband, Steve, couldn't help himself but to come out and give me a hand. So one day, Steve and I were out in the garden, and we saw this big bee flying around. It was a really crazy flyer, and it was going to our passion vine. And so Steve took this series of photos, and you can see this great big bee with all that pollen on her back headed to the passion flower. And so I, I, took, the, I took Steve's picture, and I shipped it off to Carol Clark, and she said, oh, yeah, that's the eastern carpenter bee, and it's the primary pollinator of passion vine. And I was like, this is so cool. And you can see when she landed on the flower, she's exactly the right size and shape to come in underneath the, the reproductive parts of that flower and transfer pollen. So on another day, Steve and I were out in the garden, and he took this picture of another bee on a different passion vine. And I popped it on Facebook, and I said, this is the eastern carpenter bee, and it's the number one pollinator of passion vine. And Carol Clark very quickly, very sweetly said, no, no, that's the Southern Carpenter Bee. And Texas is one of the few places where the Southern Carpenter Bee and the Eastern Carpenter Bee um, exist in the same area. So just so we remember from Pollinator 101, uh, the, the parts of the flower, how pollination works. So the male part of the flower, the anthers, delivers the pollen. And the female part of the flower, the stigma, receives the pollen. And these two parts of the flower can be active at different times during a flower's life. This is the way, one of the ways that the flower keeps from self-pollinating. So this was my moment. This was my fascinating thing, that there was a special bee that was the right size and shape to be the pollinator for a certain flower. I was like, wow, this is so cool. So I got on Google, carpenter bee, passion flower, pollinate. And up came all of these YouTube videos and websites on how to hand pollinate your passion vine if you don't have carpenter bees. And you can see this carpenter bee is, I stole this from one of those websites, and um, this carpenter bee is the right size and shape to pollinate the passion vine. But the honey bee is coming in and it's getting the nectar and it's not doing a darn thing to help that flower. Some of you may grow this tiny little passion vine in your in your yards, the Passiflora lutea. And it has its very own little passion vine bee, a small version. So this concept of co-evolution was just amazing to me. I was like, wow, this is so cool. So co-evolution is the scientific theory that two or more organisms reciprocally affect one another's evolution through natural selection. So through tiny changes, incremental changes over time, they respond to one another so that each becomes better able to survive and reproduce. Coevolution first kind of came into being way back in 1862 when our buddy Charles Darwin, the, the king of evolution, um, was received this crazy orchid with this long nectary. And he sit, writes a letter to his buddy and he says, I've just received the a box of the most extraordinary orchids from Madagascar with a nectary almost a foot long. Good heavens, what insect can suck it? There must be an insect on the island of Madagascar with a proboscis almost a foot long. Well, it wasn't until 1907, 25 years after Darwin died, before this species of giant Congo moth on Madagascar was discovered with a proboscis almost a foot long. So they named it Ex Morgani Predicti because it fulfilled the Darwin's prediction. 
And then it wasn't until 1992, 130 years later, before somebody actually observed the moth on the orchid. They need more citizen science scientists on Madagascar. So when many of us talk about native plants and we throw around this phrase, native plants and their pollinators have co-evolved over thousands of years. And I heard that and I thought that sounds great. Um, and so I used it, but then I thought I need to really research this. Well, it turns out it's over millions of years. We're talking about back in the amber, insects in amber of Jurassic Park kind of stuff. So insects appeared in the fossil record 350 million years ago in the Paleozoic. Flies appear in the Mesozoic about 200 million years ago. Flowers don't show up until the Cretaceous, and we see those fossils in our Cretaceous limestone. Bees using flowers don't show up until 100 million years ago. And then it's not till 70 million years ago that our Lepidoptera and our butterflies and moths show up. So you can see that over time, plants are developing and changing, insects are appearing and changing, and over time, this evolution is happening. In his book, Insects and Flowers, The Biology of a Partnership, Friedrich Barth explains how one family of flowers co-evolves to meet the needs of various kinds of pollinators. He says that insects um, put evolutionary pressure on the flowers to develop characteristics that the insects could use. And in turn, the plants put pressure on the insects to develop sensory abilities and learning abilities to use those characteristics. And he explains that the development of mouth parts was really the pivotal part in the development of these flower shapes and the insects. Because um, a, a bee that couldn't ingest pollen, the flower needed to offer nectar to, uh, to a, attract that pollinator. A flower with a long corolla needed a pollinator with a long proboscis. So over time, the flowers and the, in, in the pollinators are adapting to one another. And the pollinators are going out and they're selecting the best flowers. Just like a plant breeder would now select those certain ones that had the characteristics they want to carry forward, the insects were going to the particular flowers that would offer them the best reward. And that's how the flowers then, um, through natural selection, changed and reproduced. So now when we look at pollinators, we understand that there's a spectrum of specialization. So we have the generalist um, pollinators, the polylectic, who can use a wide range of plants, like our honeybees and our butterflies. Then there are specialist pollinators, the oligectic, and they focus on a certain family of plants. For instance, we'll look at the squash bee that focuses on the cucurbit family. And then we have these highly specialized pairings, the monolectic, that where the pollinator and the plant are so tightly tied to one another, one doesn't exist without the other. So you're already familiar with this concept of specialization because many of you know the story of the monarch and how the monarch caterpillar can only use milkweed. Similarly, the, the Gulfritillary on passion vine and the uh, pipe vine swallowtail on pipe vine. So this specialization story is a familiar one to you already. Why would nature specialize? Well, there are certain downsides to it, certain vulnerabilities, because if you're tightly paired to just one partner in the world and your partner's in peril, you're in jeopardy too. So in these days when we have pesticides and herbicides and, and we're losing habitat and we have invasive species, um, the, the partners are um, endangered because they may lose one to a pesticide or an herbicide or a whatever. And this is one of the reasons why we focus so much on planting native plants to keep the cycle going, to keep um, the, the plants that the pollinators need. But there are upsides to the specialization too, because uh, a pollinator and a plant that are made from one another are going to have very effective and efficient pollination. The plant is going to offer just exactly what that insect needs, and the insect is going to do just what the plant wants it to. 
very effectively. There's also pollinator consistency. So our monolectic bees are already transferring pollen from one flower to the same flower. But even our generalist bees will uh, focus on a single flower on a sortie. So we noticed during our six-legged Aggie that one day would be, uh, oh, look, it's honeybees on Gulf Coast Pinstemon, or it's carpenter bees on uh, Salvia gregei. And maybe another day it would be carpenter bees on bee mom. So the bees would go out and they would focus on a certain flower and that made them consistent pollinators to transfer pollen from similar flower to similar flower. Also, there's less competition. So if you're a bee in a plant and you've got your partner just for you, the insect doesn't have to worry about somebody else coming in and getting the pollen that it needs or wants. And over time, plants and pollinators reinforce these connections. So what are some of these coordinating traits? Well, aroma, we know that a lot of flowers smell sweet and bees are attracted to that sweet smell. But if you're a fly, you want a putrid smelling flower. And if you're a hummingbird, you really don't have much sense of smell at all. So the flower doesn't need to expend the energy to create an aroma. Bloom time is important. I never knew this, that bees synchronize their entire life cycle, and not just their life cycle, but also their daily cycle, to the plant that they service. So we'll look at the squash bee and some other bees that emerge out of their nest just in time for their plant to bloom. And then they, uh, they go through their daily cycle, um, being active, the, the plant would deliver pollen and nectar at a time when it needs, knew that the bee is active. So bloom shape is important too. So uh, pollinators with short tongues need flat or bowl shaped. So maybe like our primrose or an aster. Pollinators with longer tongues can use tubular or bell shaped flowers. And we talk a lot about nectar guides. And um, I know Janet uh, has some good pollinator talks that explain nectar guides. We'll look at that a little bit. Um, but those are important for bees, but not so much for hummingbirds. And then a flower needs to provide the reward that its pollinator is looking for. So most pollinators are looking for nectar, and the bees want pollen too. And there are certain pollinators that are seeking an oil reward, so plants offer oil. So let's look at some of these pairings. Many of you may already know the story of tequila and the fact that it comes from the agave plant, and the agave plant is completely dependent on the long-nosed bat as its pollinator. So next time you, you drink a margarita, raise your, raise your glass and, and uh, toast to the agave and the long-nosed bat. So look at this picture. It's taken at night. There aren't any bees or butterflies that fly at night, but bats do. And this agave is open at night, and it's got a pale colored bloom so it can be seen. The bat, look at this bat. It has a very long nose and little bitty ears. So unlike many bats, it's not using echolocation to find its food, it's using its nose. And the agave puts out a plant that's attractive to the bat. And the bat can hover, so the agave doesn't need to offer a landing pad for its pollinator. And look at that nose. It is a long little nose that can get in and dive into those flowers to get the nectar. And while it's in there, pollen is collecting on all those little fuzzy bat hairs. So this is a very tightly um, knit pollinator um, plant pairing. One doesn't exist without the other. Similarly, the yucca has its own pairing, and it is a, bloom, a, a plant that blooms at night. It's a pale color. It's pollinated by a night flying pollinator, and it puts out an aroma at night. The yucca is pollinated by the yucca moth. And this little moth has special tentacles that allow it to come in and sever the pollen from a yucca flower and carry it to another flower to pollinate. And it's super important to the mother yucca moth that she 
to, she gets that gecko pollinated. So she, she severs the pollen, she finds another blossom that's not yet been pollinated, and she uses her special tools to force that pollen down into the female part of the flower. And then she lays her eggs there. And this is all important to her because when her eggs emerge, those larvae are gonna eat the seeds and the fruit that the yucca has produced. So the mama uh, moth is absolutely hell bent to make sure she pollinates that yucca. And the yucca is like, yippee, I've got a pollinator who is determined to do the very thing that I want and need to pollinate my flower. So again, the yucca and the yucca moth are completely dependent on one another. One doesn't exist without the other. So now we get to bees. I never knew until I did this eight, the six-legged Aggie deal that we have over 800 species of bees in Texas. 90% of our bees are solitary nesters, 70% nest in the ground, and 30% are cavity nesters. And then of course, they're attracted to our native plants. And they, their life cycle, they have an annual life cycle that they time according to the plants that they service. So the spring emerging bees may overwinter as an adult bee just waiting to emerge. So that would be like our cute little mason bees that come out in the early spring. Our summer bees have overwintered as a pupa. So they are continuing to form until summer rolls around. And that might be our leaf cutter bees or our squash bees that are waiting for the summer plants to emerge. And then the fall uh, bees that pollinate like our fall aster have, have uh, overwintered as a larva. Bees are attracted to certain kinds of flowers. So they really like a flower that has bilateral symmetry, that has a mirror image to its bloom shape. They like flowers that are blue or purple or yellow or even white. This is some of the data from our six-legged Aggie experiment, and you can see that the purple and the pink flowers were particularly popular with the bees. A little bit the orange and the yellow, but not so much the red. And this is because bees see into the ultraviolet spectrum. So all of that purple and pink um, and on into yellow, they love that. But red is kind of a muddy brown to them. And nectar guides, with their UV vision, the flower on the left is a flower as we would see it. And we can sort of see a nectar guide there a little bit. Um, but with UV vision, the bee really sees that nectar guide. It is that a big old billboard, come to the center, come get the stuff. Um, so their vision is different from ours. Bees also are attracted to flowers that require some physical manipulation. So you may know that bumblebees can do what we call buzz pollination where they grab hold of a flower and they use their flight muscles um, to shake that flower and to, uh, to loosen the pollen. You may, if, if you grow tomatoes, you may have been told to shake your tomato flowers and that's to get the pollen loose. That's what a bee is doing. And I just learned the other day that um, a tuning fork at middle C is just the right, um, <laughs> it emulates the bee uh, buzz pollination. But so this is really important for plants that have a porosetal anther. And bumblebees are used commercially to pollinate eggplant and tomatoes. And you can see on this cinna plant that really unusual tubular anther, the porosetal anther. So bees like they like to manipulate the pea flower also. So uh, this spring, when we have the blue bonnets, go out and watch the blue bonnets and see if you can see a bee land on that and push the keel down open and the, the reproductive parts of the flower will emerge out of that keel and the bee manipulates that and spreads the pollen that way. So bees with a little bit of a tongue can use a, a, a slightly um, tubular flower like this bumblebee. Look at that long tongue it has tucked up under, and y'all see that underneath, um, coming into this uh, mealy blue sage. Medium and short tongue bees need a flat flower so they can access the pollen and nectar. 
And then our little bitty bees, this is frog fruit, so you know how tiny that blossom is and how teeny tiny that bee is. Um, but look, she's got all her stripes and all her pollen packed on her legs and the whole bit. Um, but they need little flowers or composite flowers. So this is one of my favorite um, plant pollinator pairings. This is a squash bee. So if you grow squash and you get flowers, but you don't set fruit, you probably don't have squash bees because they are the primary pollinator of, of cucurbits. And they, uh, cucurbit flowers open early in the morning and they're only open for a short period of time. So they need a bee that gets up at the crack of dawn and the squash bee is the very one. It can fly at low temperatures and in very low light, even almost darkness, because it has these, oh silly, uh oh, what have I done? I was trying to use the pointer to show these cool D eyes. So I won't use the pointer. Um, the middle, the little middle button, the yellow. Okay. So see these little eyes on the top of her head? Those allow her to see um, in very low light. And she has scopa on her legs that are unbranched. So a honeybee, the scopa on the honeybee's legs are much finer. But the um, scopa on the squash bee's legs are large because the pollen grains on squash are very large pollen grains. So the honeybee can come into the squash flower, but it has a very hard time transferring that pollen around because it can't pick up the pollen as easily. So those of you who like to get on the prairie might recognize this. This is ratney or cremaria. And it's one of our uh, prairie plants that emerges along about May. And it's a plant that offers oil as its reward. So it is dependent upon the centrus bee. And the centrus bee is the right size and shape to come into the flower and get the, nectar, get the oil that it needs to mix with pollen to feed to its larvae. According to iNaturalist, this is the range of the centrus bee. There are a number of species of centrus bees. But you can see that they are in these warm areas. And that's where a lot of oil producing plants grow. But the cremaria is only in a very small area, a small range. And it is available only where the centrus bee is. So the centrus bee can use other oil producing plants, but the cremaria can only, is, can only exist where centrus bees live. Another of our super fun prairie plants is spring beauty. So late February, March, into the spring, you may see these tiny flowers in clumps on the prairie, and it is pollinated by the spring beauty bee. Unlike the squash bee that gets up at the crack of dawn and is working, the spring beauty bee reports to the office about 10.30, she knocks off at 2.30, and she's not gonna show up if it's cloudy, rainy, or a little bit cool, um, because she knows she's a diva. She knows that the spring beauty flower is only gonna be open and offering pollen and nectar when it's sunny and nice out. One thing that's really cool about the spring beauty bee is that in the afternoon, um, after her work is done, she, she goes down into her little hole where she's laid her eggs and she covers it up with dirt and that protects her and her larvae from nighttime predators. Many of you may grow wine cup in your garden. So this beautiful magenta flower and you can see that super white pollen in the middle. Well, not surprisingly, it is pollinated by the wine cup bee. And I've never seen a wine cup bee, but this is a wine cup bee hole. And you can identify that because the wine cup bee is one of the bees that can ingest pollen. So that super white pollen creates super white pollen bee poop. And she's a very fastidious little housekeeper. So she kicks the bee poop out of her nest and she lines the nest, the edge of the nest with this white stuff. And that helps us identify that that's where a wine cup bee is, 
but we think it also helps her identify where her hole is. So when she goes foraging, she knows where to get go home. So now we get to hummingbirds. Steve and I went to Mexico not long ago, and we learned that the word they use for hummingbirds in Mexico is chupamirto, which means salvia sucker. And um, we know that uh, hummingbirds use salvia. Of course, they use other plants in our gardens as well. So what are some of the traits that make this pollinator plant pairing? Well, hummingbirds have long bills, so they can use tubular flowers, flowers with a deep nectary, a long corolla. They have a highly developed ability to perceive red, so they're mostly attracted to red flowers, although they use other flowers too. And we know that hummingbirds are very busy. They have a very high metabolic need. So they're looking for flowers that, whose nectar has, is high in sucrose, where bees use nectar that's high in fructose and glucose. And hummingbirds have the ability to hover. So this is a really cool picture, and you can see the hummingbird has come in, and it's using that deep nectary. And while its bill is in, in the flower getting the nectar, its forehead is in the perfect position to transfer pollen from flower to flower. And this little carpenter bee is in there getting that nectar, and it may or may not brush up against the pollen, probably not. So there's more to this hummingbird story than meets the eye. Not only does the hummingbird have a long bill, it also has this super long tongue. It's so long it has to wrap it around its little bird brain while it's not using it. So these are some of the flowers that we grow in our gardens to attract hummingbirds. The standing cypress, the Turk's cat, the flame acanthus. And you can see these flowers are red. They have either a long corolla or a deep nectary, and they have all of the reproductive parts of the flower extending way past the blossom. So this is the perfect setup for the hummingbird to insert the bill, get the nectar, and transfer the pollen from flower to flower on its head. So you may go out in your garden like I go out in mine, and there's red flowers, and there's blue flowers, and there's bees on some, and hummingbirds on some, and it gets a little bit confusing, um, and there are plants that are pollinated by both bees and hummingbirds. Um, but a lot of times, the bees and hummingbirds are just getting the nectar and they aren't really pollinating. And this is a really cool thing. Scientists have um, been studying the, the coevolution of salvias between uh, bee and hummingbird pollinators. So salvia, there are like 900 species of salvias in the world. It's one, it is the largest uh, genus in the Lamiaceae family. But in the Americas, where we have hummingbirds, we have some distinct salvias that aren't found anywhere else. In North America, we have about 40 species. Central America, lots of hummingbirds there, 350 species. South America, 210 species. And scientists, um, theorize that at one point sal all salvias were pollinated by bees. But the hummingbirds, remember our fossil record? And we thought that the moths and butterflies were kind of late showing up 70 million years ago. Hummingbirds didn't show up until 22 million years ago. So the, they theorized that the salvias had to co-evolve together with the hummingbirds as the hummingbirds came on the scene. And so they began to study these salvias and as scientists do, they took every data point in the world. How big is the, how long is the corolla? How big is the top part? How wide is the lip? What's the flower angle? Does it put out any aroma? All of those things that they looked at to study. And they, they came up with this analysis that there are certain salvias that are pollinated only by hummingbirds. Those are the ones in the red. And certain salvias that are pollinated only by bees. Those are the ones in the blue. And not only that about salvias, but salvias have this really cool active lever. So for most flowers, pollination is, uh, pollen delivery is a static thing. The flower is just there, the nectar and pollen is there, the pollinator comes. But in salvia, it actually has a lever. So you can see on the bottom left, the bee is coming in to get the nectar. And as he comes into the flower, the little lever comes down and delivers pollen onto the bee's body. So that would be a young flower where the male part of the flower is active. 
On the right is a little bit older flower, and you see, you can see that the stigma has dropped. So when the bee comes into the nectar to get the nectar, he delivers that pollen to the female part of the flower. And they begin to look at these different salvias and the different bees, and they notice that the levers in the various sizes of salvias and various sizes of bees were delivering pollen onto different parts of the, of the bees. And they concluded from that that this is one of the ways that salvia has speciated. And salvias and hummingbirds both are uh, speciate very easily. In this salvia, this is a hummingbird pollinated salvia, and you can see how the anthers are perfectly positioned to come in, and when the hummingbird gets the nectar, it delivers that pollen on the sides of the hummingbird's face. In these two hummingbird pollinated salvias, the, um, the pollen is delivered on their head, and you can see there's two different delivery methods there. And they actually took little museum stuffed hummingbird specimens and held up salvia flowers and, you know, did the thing and watched where the pollen came on the, on the hummingbird's body. So this is a fun little parlor trick that you can play. This is a salvia garnetica. And I'm going to come in like I'm a hummingbird and put my beak deep in to get the nectar and boom, down comes the lever. Delivering the pollen. Let's look at it again. Here comes the pollen. Very fun. The salvia darcii, you can actually see the lever through the flower. So you come in, the male part of the flower comes down and delivers the pollen. <coughs> this is a young flower, so the male part of the flower is active. But you can see the the uh, female part of the flower is up there ready. As this flower matures, the female part of the flower is going to drop down, and it'll be ready to receive the pollen. You can do this on mealy blue sage, too, which um, has a shorter corolla, um, but it's a little bit hard to video. But this is a bee-pollinated salvia, so it has a landing pad. And the bee comes in, lands on this mealy blue sage, inserts that long tongue, and triggers the lever. So for some reason in 2022, there were all kinds of research papers written about this coevolution, this change in salvia to be bee pollinated or hummingbird pollinated. So this stuff is right fresh off the presses for you guys, cutting edge research. Um, and uh, so this is a fascinating thing that is being observed. We're talking tonight about citizen science, so you can, if you want to take some screenshots, I'm going to show some citizen science links, but I'll, I'll send these links around. There is a citizen science project right now about hummingbirds called Hummingbirds at Home by Audubon, and it's asking citizen scientists like you and me to go out into our yards and observe our, hunting, our hummingbirds, what flowers they go to, whether or not you have feeders in your yard, what um, plants you might have brought in from the nursery uh, that attract the hummingbirds because they're looking at um, how climate change and how our nursery purchases are affecting the lives of hummingbirds. So I hope you'll be like Mary Oliver and you'll go out and you'll pay attention. You'll go out in your garden and look. We owe much of what we understand about butterflies to a 13-year-old girl who was born in Germany in 1647. Maria Sibylla Marion took her watercolors out into her garden, and with photographic accuracy, she painted what she saw. She saw a butterfly on a certain plant lay an egg that became a caterpillar, and she followed the instars. It became a chrysalis and it became a butterfly. And this was revolutionary because up until this time, people had this understanding that butterflies were things of the God. They were spiritual. They were wonderful. And caterpillars were things of the devil that were awful and hated. And they never understood that it was the same critter. So uh, Maria Sibylla Marion revolutionized our understanding of nature and science. This was the beginning of changing our looking at nature from philosophers to looking at it from observational science. It was the beginning of what we call the scientific method. So Maria Sibylla Marion was one of the first citizen scientists. 
So I hope you'll go out in your yard and you will look carefully and maybe you'll see a little bee drilling a hole in the side of a flower, nectar robbing like Steve got this picture. And go and look and see what those critters and see what in the world they are up to. Plant things close enough to your house so that it's when you're working at your desk or you're washing your dishes, you can see what is going on in your yard. Yogi Berra said you can observe a lot just by watching. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope that you will watch and participate in citizen science. You'll get a little homework and maybe you'll learn something. You'll, you'll learn whether this is a bee or a fly. Maybe your homework one day will be to find an orange pollinator on an orange flower. And when you're out looking for things that are orange, you'll learn the difference between the evil leaf-footed bug nymph versus the beneficial milkweed assassin bug. Or maybe your homework will be to learn to identify ladybugs. There's a citizen science project right now that's asking us to go out and find dead butterflies and moths. Don't kill them, just find ones that are already dead and mail them in because scientists are wanting to understand how environmental contaminants like pesticides and antibiotics are affecting our lipidopterin. So there's the citizen science project for you no matter what your interests are. If it's plants or insects or birds, um, there's something out there for you. And I'll share these links. So there's another famous Mary Oliver poem, you know, the one where she says, what are you gonna do with your one wild and precious life? In a lot of that poem, she is holding a grasshopper and she's watching it chew. And she says, I know how to pay attention. So I hope that we all will pay attention and be astonished and tell about it through citizen science. That's all I have. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Would you uh, remind us of the uh, Audubon website about hummingbirds? Hummingbirds at home. At home. And I'll um, I'll give these to some somebody to put on our website or something so you can because there's all kinds of really fun ones. You know we're about into bird we're into bird migration right now. So Audubon has lots of you know the backyard bird count and all of those fun things about our birds too. And of course the monarchs are coming. So um, Journey North and all of those fun monarch things. Actually, I just looked it up. Hummingbirds at home has wound down. They're done. Oh, it has? Oh, well, darn. Yeah. Sorry. It wound down. If they're not doing it. Because they're leaving. Oh. Right. Well, it yeah. said it wound down. So. No, no, no. The project in 2021. Oh, the project. Oh, it wound down. Yeah. Well, rats. Anyway. Still doesn't mean we can't look at them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So I don't have anything else. Do you have? Just a reminder, if anybody somehow escaped hearing about our next Native Landscape Certification Program class, will be this weekend, the level one class, the precursor to the other classes, uh, you can still register. We currently have 61 people enrolled in Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, last week had 25. So um, we do the Saturday, the lectures are on Zoom, and then Sunday we do live plant walks. And for Dallas, the, those walks happen for level one at the Laura W. Bush Native Park, which is there at the George Bush Library on the SMU campus. And we'll have groups of 10 going out with a walk leader, several of whom are here today. Um, and you'll, you'll see the plants in action, so to speak, growing where they are. Of course, some of the plants are spring bloomers, so you're not going to see them blooming now, but we'll have plant samples. We'll try to have samples of every plant. So it's a very good um, comprehensive class. 
you learn about 50 plants. 45 of them are great native plants that you should be trying to grow if you have the right conditions for them. And five of them are invasive plants that you should never plant. And, you know, if you want to do the really right thing, if you already have them in your yard, you would remove Full disclosure, I have a huge ligustrum tree <laughs> that shades my bedroom that I'm not cutting it down. <laughs> but, you know, that's the way it is. That's been there. My house is, I've been in my house 45 years. It was there when I moved here. And um, I know it's not a good plant, but in my situation,